Hey Maggie, wake up. It's time to do some topology. We're going to discuss open and closed subsets of subspaces of Euclidean space. Let's start with the definition. Let X be a subspace of Euclidean space, Rn as usual. A subset Z of X is closed if and only if it is equal to its closure. Notice that one always has a containment of Z inside the closure of Z, but in order for Z to be closed, we're going to demand that these two things be actually equal. So in particular, we're going to require that any point that is close to Z is actually contained in Z. The complementary notion is the notion of openness. A subset U of X is going to said to be open if and only if its complement is closed. Another way of saying that is that a subset U is open if and only if no point of U is close to the complement of U. Let's look at some examples. In R, if I look at the subset consisting of the interval, well, this is the interval that we often call the closed interval, so we better hope that this is actually going to be a closed subset. And I have good news, the world is not so bad, it is indeed a closed subset. Why? Well, if I contemplate the closure of 0, 1, then I'll get 0, 1 again, the closed interval from 0, 1. Nothing is going to change, and so that means that we really are a closed subset. On the other hand, it's certainly not open. After all, there are points, like the number 1, that are close to the complement of 0, 1 inside our set, and so that means this thing cannot be open. Now let's look at the so-called half-open interval, where I'm including 0, but I'm not including 1. Well, in that case, the fact that I'm not including 1 is a bit of a problem, because when I close, 0, 1, when I form the closure, I'm going to get that 1. And so that means that I have a point that's close to 0, 1, that's not in 0, 1. So it's not closed. Is it open? Well, it's not open either, because I have a point, namely 0, that is close to the complement, but is actually inside my set. So that's not open. Okay, well now let's look at the third example here, the open interval from 0 to 1. And that turn of phrase must tell us that this thing is open, right? And yes, yes it is. It is indeed open. There aren't any points of 0, 1, the open interval, that are close to the complement of 0, 1. Okay, phew. Is 0, 1 closed? No, it's not closed, because there are points like 1 that are close to 0, 1, but are not contained in it. Okay, let's be more interesting here. Let's think about the empty set. With the empty set, well, one of the rules that we saw about the closure operator is that the closure of the empty set is always the empty set. That was one of the things that we proved last time. So that means its closure is itself, so that means that it really is closed. On the other hand, its complement is the entire real line. And if I think about the entire real line, and I take its closure, well then, there's nowhere to go. I've got to have the real line again. So the empty set is also open. Well, R here is exactly the complement of the empty set inside R. And so since the empty set is closed, the real line is open. And since the empty set is open, the real line is closed. But for now, let's discuss a proposition. The idea here is that if you know what the closed subsets of your subspace are, then you can compute the closure as the smallest of those closed subsets. More precisely, if X is a subspace of Rn, and S is a subset of that X, then the closure of S will be the smallest closed subset of X that contains S. 
What do I have to do in order to prove this? Well, I have to check three things. First, I have to check that tau xs actually contains s. It turns out we already did that. Then I have to check that the closure of s is actually closed. It turns out we already did that as well. And finally, I have to show that if I have a closed subset of x that contains s, then it also contains the closure, because that's what it means for it to be the smallest closed subset that contains s. So let's prove each of these sentences, realizing that we've already done most of the work. The closure of s contains s, and we already proved that. Secondly, we discovered that the closure of the closure is just the closure again, and so it therefore follows that the closure is in fact closed. Finally, if S is a subset of some closed set Z sitting inside my X, well, I can close up S, and I can also close up Z, and this containment will be preserved because remember the closure is an inclusion preserving operation. But this closure is exactly equal to Z again, so that I see that my closure is contained in Z. Here's another proposition. This proposition is going to deal with the fact that when we form the closure operator, we're doing it in a relative way. We're doing it relative to the subspace X. The closure as formed in Rn might not agree with the closure as we took it in X. We saw examples of that last time. So that has an impact on the question of whether or not things in X are open or closed. And so what I want to do now is I want to give a criterion to check whether something is open or closed in X in terms of the question of whether something is open or closed inside Rn. Here's the sentence. Let x in Rn be a subspace, as always. A subset u of x is open if and only if there's an open subset u prime of Rn, not of x, whose intersection with x recovers our u. So u is going to be open if and only if we can grow it to an open subset of Rn. That's the sentence about open subsets, but there's a dual sentence about closed subsets, which just follows from the open sentence just by taking complements. So dually, a subset Z of X is closed if and only if there's a closed subset Z prime of Rn whose intersection with X is our Z. And this is just exactly the dual statement to the first statement. So what we're going to do here is we're going to prove the first statement, and the second statement will follow by forming complements. Okay, well, what does it mean for u prime to be open? It precisely means that for every point of the intersection of u prime with x, there is an epsilon such that if y is a point of x that is within epsilon of our x, then y is actually contained in the intersection. After all, it must be contained in u prime, but we assumed that it was contained in x, so it must be in both. Conversely, if we have an open subset of our x, then we can form the complement. That complement is now a closed subset of x. It might not be closed in Rn. In general, it won't be. But it is a closed subset of x. So what can we do with it? Well, we can close it up inside Rn instead of just in x. And we can look at the complement there inside the ambient Rn. We'll call that our u prime. This is now open inside Rn, because after all, it's the complement of a closed. Okay, so 
now let's think about what happens here. If I take my z, that's equal to the closure of z in x, but the closure of z in x is the same thing as taking the closure in Rn and intersecting it with x. Now by taking complements, we see that u prime here, if I intersect it with x, becomes exactly my u. Let's look at some more examples. Here we're going to contemplate this half open interval from 0 to 1. And by the argument that we've already given, we've seen that inside the real line, it's neither closed nor open. However, things become quite different if I contemplate it as a subspace of, say, this open ray from 0 to infinity. In this open ray from 0 to infinity, when I try to form the closure of 0, 1, I can't pick up the 0 because I don't have it. Therefore, I've already got everything I need. In other words, this is closed. It is not, however, open because 1 is close to the complement of s in x. So it's closed, but not open. Now let's see what happens when I use the sort of the opposite ray. This is the ray that goes from 1 to minus infinity, so the opposite direction, and I'm going to include the point 1 in my ray, so this is a closed ray. And inside there I'll look at this half open interval, and well what do I see? I see that in fact this thing is not closed because after all 0 is close to this subset and 0 is in my x, so it's definitely not closed, but it is open. The complement of this is the closed ray from 0 to minus infinity. And now lastly, we can look at our sub subset S sitting inside itself. If we think about that, then we see that it's both closed and open. What we see here is that the question of whether or not this subset is open or closed depends in a critical way on what our X is, where we're looking to see whether it's open or closed. It's neither open nor closed in R. It's closed but not open in this open ray from 0 to infinity. It's open but not closed inside this closed ray from 1 to minus infinity. And it's both open and closed in itself. Now let's go up a dimension. Let's look inside R2. And let's look at the points of R2 whose distance from the origin is strictly greater than 0 and less than or equal to 1. That's this picture right here. I've excluded this point, but I'm including everything along the circle here. Well, in this case, what happens? In this case, it's certainly not closed because the origin is close to this set, but it's not contained in this set. But it's not open either because the points along this boundary here are close to the complement, but they're in my set, and therefore this can't be open. So this is neither open nor closed. The situation improves if I take the closure of this set inside the plane minus the origin. Now, suddenly, the subset is closed, but it's still no longer open. On the other hand, I can look here at the set of points in the plane whose distance from the origin is less than or equal to 1. That's everything inside this circle, including the boundary and including the origin. Well, now my subset is certainly no longer closed, because after all, the origin is close to my subset. But my subset is now open. As a final example, and this is something that we'll be coming back to when we think about connectedness in a couple of lectures, I want to think about this subset here. This is the subset of elements in the plane whose first coordinate is exactly 1. In other words, it's a vertical line inside the plane. And this is the subset of points in the plane where the absolute value of the first coordinate is 1. In other words, this is the union of two lines. And so the question that we have is, is this line open or closed inside the union of these two lines? And the answer is that it's both. Well, there's no reason to stop now with the examples. Let's keep them going. So suppose that I have a subspace of Euclidean space. Then every finite subset, S of x, 
is closed. Let's think about why. Well, if I have a point of my x, s, this is the shortest distance that x will have to an element of my s. Now, since s is just finite, there really is a point, s and s, such that the distance is my d. So either the point little x is close to s or it isn't. If x is close to s, then that implies that this d is actually just zero. But if this d is zero, then that means that the distance from x to some point of my s is zero. And that means that x is actually equal to s and therefore inside s. In other words, every point that is close to my s is actually in my s. That means that s is closed. What does that tell us? That tells us that if we have a subspace of Rn that is itself finite, then every subset of that x is both open and closed. We say that x is discrete in that case. Discrete means that every subset of our x is both open and closed. Here's an example of a different flavor. Let's consider the subset of the plane consisting of those points x comma zero where x is contained in the open interval from zero to one. This is really just that interval regarded as a subset of the plane rather than r itself. The funny thing that happens, however, is that this subset is now neither closed nor open. Oh, hi, Maggie. Uh, what are you reading? Let's just look here. An important concept for us in topology is the idea of an open neighborhood of a point. Here's the definition for subspaces of Euclidean space. Let x and rn be a subspace as always, and let little x here be a point of our x. An open subset of x that contains our point is called an open neighborhood. This is a useful definition because it gives us an easy way to recognize when points are close to subsets of our x. So for our subspace x, we can let s be a subset, and we can ask whether this point here, little x, is close to our s. And the answer is that it is close if and only if every open neighborhood of x contains a point of our subset s. Here's the proof. On the one hand, if I do have an open neighborhood of x that is disjoint from my subset s, then when I form the closure of s, that'll be contained in the complement of u. That exactly means that x is not close to s. Conversely, if x is not in the closure, then the complement of that closure is exactly an open neighborhood of our point x that is disjoint from our subset s. Here's another proposition which is almost just a corollary of the previous proposition. If we have a subspace of Rn and a subset u of that subspace, then that subset will be open if and only if for every point of u there exists an epsilon greater than zero such that the ball of radius epsilon around x intersected with our subspace x is contained in u. The proof follows quite naturally from what we've already done. If I take the complement of my u, then u is going to be open if and only if for every point of u, that point is not close to z. Well, what does it mean to not be close to z? It exactly means that there exists an epsilon greater than zero such that the ball of radius epsilon around x doesn't intersect our z. Let's use these propositions in some examples. 
So first, we can contemplate the rational numbers sitting inside the real line. If x is a real number and epsilon is greater than zero, then the ball of radius epsilon around x must contain a rational number. For that matter, it also contains an irrational number. So that tells us something kind of interesting, which is that the closure of the rationals is the same thing as the closure of the irrationals, which is the real line itself. When this kind of thing happens, we have a word for it. We say that q and r minus q are both dense in the real line r. Well, that tells us something straight away. After all, the closure of q is r, so q certainly can't be closed, but it can't be open either because the closure of its complement is also r. So in particular, q is neither open nor closed in r. And indeed, the same thing follows for the complement. The complement is neither open nor closed in r. Here's another example. Let's look at the dyadic rationals. These are the fractions a over 2 to the n, where a is some integer and n is a natural number. And we'll consider these things sitting inside the real line. Well, once again, we're going to have this density property. For every point x of r, and for every epsilon greater than 0, there is going to be a dyadic rational that's within epsilon of our x. In other words, every point of r can be approximated by a dyadic rational to any tolerance that you like. Well, that exactly means that this set d is dense in r. Here we arrive at the last proposition of this lecture. In this proposition, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be trying to understand what kinds of operations will preserve closedness and openness. That is to say, when we think about our closed subsets and our open subsets of our subspace X, we're going to be asking ourselves, what can we do to those subsets that will keep them open or keep them closed? The proposition is as follows. If you have a subspace X of Rn, then the closed subsets of X are stable under intersection, and this is intersection of any size whatsoever, and only finite union. This might not be a familiar turn of phrase to you. When we say that something is stable under certain operations, it means that we can do those operations to any elements of our class, in this case our class of closed subsets, and remain within that class. To unpack that further, what does that mean? That means that if I have a subset of the power set, a collection of subsets, and if all of those subsets are closed, then their intersection will also be closed. Furthermore, if that collection is a finite collection, then the union will also be closed. The dual statement about open sets is also true. Open subsets of our subspace X are stable under arbitrary union, unions of any size whatsoever, and finite intersection. Again, what does that mean? Let's unpack it. That means that if you have a collection, O, of open subsets of X, and I take their union, then that will remain open. If, in addition, O is a finite collection of open subsets, then its intersection will also be open. Let's just quickly emphasize that the finiteness hypotheses there are really important. For example, an infinite union of closed subsets might no longer be closed. Here are two examples happening in the real line. I can take the union of these closed intervals, where I'm trying to get to the interval from minus 1 to 1, but I have these small error terms that are keeping me too small. And I'm going to take the union over all of those error terms. What I end up with never includes minus 1 or 1, so I'm left with an open interval. 
So an infinite union of closed things can be open. That happens sometimes. But it needn't be open, just like it needn't be closed. For example, I can take the closed interval from 0 to 1 minus 1 over n, and take the union over all n's, and I'll end up with this half-open interval, which is neither open nor closed.